with wide ranging and cheap, deep social and economic uh, effects. Current forecasts from the IMF show global gross domestic product decreasing by about 3% this year. Economic contractions are expected to be deepest in the second quarter of 2020, with gradual recoveries in the third and the fourth quarters of the year. The strength of the global economic recovery will depend in part on how quickly countries are able to open up for economic activity safely, and in particular, how effectively societies comply with social distancing rules. The World Health Organization advises that further complications from the virus are being identified and the pandemic is unlikely to end quickly with the virus coming in waves over time. The crisis has caused extreme volatility in financial asset prices with sharp and deep market sell-offs followed recently by a partial recovery. Investor interest in higher yielding assets has improved somewhat in recent days, but the general environment reflects pronounced levels of risk aversion, in particular for emerging market currencies, equities, and bonds. Uncertainty about future global economic prospects, trade relationships, and supply chains has increased again. Policy responses to the crisis have generally been robust, with the magnitude dependent on the degree of policy space available to countries. The US Federal Reserve has taken further steps to expand its balance sheet, and the European Central Bank has made similar commitments. Emerging and developing economies generally have less policy space available and credit is more expensive. The international financial institutions have made available extraordinary levels of emergency financial support to respond to COVID-19. The COVID-19 outbreak has major health, social, and economic uh, impacts, presenting challenges in forecasting domestic economic activity. The compilation of accurate economic statistics will also remain severely challenged. The bank currently expects GDP in 2020 to contract by 7% compared to the 6.1% contraction forecast in April. Even as the lockdown is relaxed in some coming, in coming months, for the year as a whole, investment, exports, and imports are expected to decline sharply. Job losses are also expected to be widespread. Easing of the lockdown will support growth in the near term and some high frequency activity indicators show a pickup in spending from extremely low levels. However, getting back to pre-pandemic uh, activity levels will take time. GDP is expected to grow by 3.8% in 2021 and by 2.9% in 2020. 22. South Africa's term of terms of trade remain robust. Commodity export prices have eased in recent weeks, but are still at healthy levels. Oil prices remain low. The spot price for Brent crude oil is currently around $34 per barrel and is expected to remain around these levels in coming months, contributing to reduced petrol price inflation. For our forecast, the Brent crude oil price is expected to average $37 per barrel in 2020 and $45 per barrel in 2021. Exceptionally accommodative policies and the relaxation of lockdowns in many advanced economies have supported a partial recovery in global financial markets. But financing conditions for emerging markets 
remain uncertain. Domestically, credit risk associated with public borrowing needs remain very high, contributing to non-resident investors sales of about 149 billion rands of local currency denominated assets. The rent has depreciated by 22.9% against the US dollar since January and by 0.7% since the April meeting of the MPC. The implied starting point for the rent forecast is 18 rents 40 to the US dollar compared with 17 rents 80 at the time of the previous meeting. Resident investors have increased purchases of long-term bonds, helping to ease yields in recent days, but the yield curve remains exceptionally steep. The bank's headline consumer price inflation forecast averages 3.4% for 2020 and 4.4% in 2021 and 2022. The forecast for core inflation is lower at 3.5% in 2020, 3.8% in 2021, and 4.1% in 2022. The overall risks to the inflation outlook at this time appear to be to the downside, but less clearly so compared to conditions in March and April. Global producer price and food inflation appear to have bottomed out. Oil prices remain low, but have recovered somewhat. Local food price inflation is also expected to remain contained. Risks to inflation from currency depreciation are expected to stay muted while pass-through remains slow. However, electricity and other administered prices remain a concern. Upside risks to inflation could also emerge from heightened fiscal risks and sharp reductions in the supply of goods and services. Expectations of future inflation continued to soften, but broadly remain around the midpoint of the bend. Market-based inflation expectations for short and medium term have fallen while long-term inflation expectations remain higher. Despite sustained higher levels of country financing risk, the committee notes that the economic contraction and slow recovery will keep inflation well below the midpoint of the target range for this year. Barring inflation risks outlined earlier, inflation is expected to be well contained over the medium term, remaining close to the midpoint in 2021 and 2022. Against this backdrop, the MPC decided to cut the repo rate by 50 basis points, taking it to 3.75% per annum with effect from the 22nd of May, 2020. Three members preferred a cut of 50 basis points and two members a cut of 25 basis points. The implied path for policy rates over the forecast period generated by the quarterly projection model indicates two repo rate cuts of 25 basis points in the next two quarters of 20. 20. Monetary policy can ease financial conditions and improve the resilience of households and firms to the economic implications of COVID-19. In addition to continued easing of interest rates, the bank has eased regulatory requirements on banks and has taken important steps to ensure adequate liquidity in domestic markets. These actions are intended to free up more capital for lending by financial institutions to households and firms. Monetary policy, however, cannot on its own improve the potential growth rate of the economy 
or reduce fiscal risks. These should be addressed by implementing prudent macroeconomic policies and structural reforms that lower costs generally and increase investment opportunities, potential growth, and job creation. Such steps will further reduce existing constraints on monetary policy and its transmission to the broader economy. Global economic and financial conditions are expected to remain volatile for the foreseeable future. In this highly uncertain environment, future decisions will continue to be data dependent and sensitive to the balance of risks to the outlook. The MPC will seek to look through temporary price shocks and focus on second round effects. As usual, the repo rate projection from the QPM remains a broad policy guide changing from meeting to meeting in response to new data and risks. This concludes uh, our statement and um, we are in unusual times and I hope that you will be able to uh, use the technology. You can raise your uh, electronic hand by uh, using the uh, facility on this platform or alternatively, you can type your question on uh, the chat group of uh, this meeting. We are open now for questions. Is anybody there? Hi, hi, Gabrielle Steinhauser here from the Wall Street Journal. Um, quick question, with the CPI release uh, delayed and you said the sort of difficulties in gathering uh, data for for economic indicators, how hard has it been for the Monetary Policy Committee and your staff to make predictions for inflation and other indicators going into the future? So if you don't know what the economic picture is now and we're facing an unprecedented crisis, how, how are you able to sort of tell us what's lying ahead and make policy accordingly? Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Any other questions? I would like to take uh, two more at least. Hi, Governor. It's Mariam Issa from FinWeek. Um, can you tell us whether you expect the economic recovery to be V shaped or U shaped? Is there any chance that inflation will fall below 3%? And um, are you still buying bonds now that the, the market is functioning better than it was before? Last one. Uh, Governor, it's Pranisha from Bloomberg. Um, yes, Pranisha. What? Why 50 basis points? Did you discuss a uh, cut by a bigger margin? And uh, when it comes to your bond buying program, how are, do you assess its effectiveness so far? Are you going to continue? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those questions. Uh, Gabriela, the uncertainty of the data, if the release is postponed, uh, it does not necessarily affect the forecast that we have. There are, however, measurement issues. I think Stats SA had stated that um, the coverage might be lower than it had been uh, in the past. So that might not impact our forecast, but it would impact the actual measurement that, uh, that actually comes, uh, comes out. In this respect, we are not, we are not alone. Uh, all countries are facing, most countries are facing exactly the same, uh, the same uh, uh, situation. And as we have stated in the, in the statement, these are uncertain times, and these uncertain times are actually making economic forecasting very, very uh, tricky. In our situation here, where you have the lockdown, there are whole industries that have been shut down. How do you assess at what price were they going to sell? So we are going to have to wait for 
State FA, when they come uh, out with the figure, there are a number of adjustments that statisticians uh, would make when they are faced with a situation like this. And I think that we would wait for FSA uh, to, tell us, uh, uh, to tell us that. The forecast that we have now has incorporated all of the data that we know to date. And we had had to make assumptions about the future trajectory of uh, other data. But that makes it really, really difficult as you correctly, as correctly pointed, uh, pointed out. Uh, Miriam, um, I'm not sure I am very good with the letters of the alphabet. Uh, you say whether this would be V-shaped. Um, people are talking of a V-shaped recovery, a U-shaped recovery. People are talking of a W-shaped recovery. People are talking of an L-shaped uh, recovery. The truth of the matter is that when forecasters start to give you letters and not numbers, that tells you how uncertain the forecasting environment uh, is. Because you see, with a letter, it doesn't matter. Uh, as long as you have given the letter, the numbers do not seem to matter for you as long as they fit the letter. I do not think it is very useful to talk about uh, those letters. We have put on a forecast now, and that forecast has got uh, has got risks. And what we do know is that there had been a significant uh, slowdown, and actually we say that a contraction as a result uh, of the sh this supply and demand shock that we have seen from COVID-19. And the appropriate responses that governments across the world have taken of going into, uh, in into a lockdown. So I cannot say to you what shape the recovery would be. Suffice to say that there will be a recovery uh, uh, next year, um, and we can always argue about, uh, uh, about the figures. Uh, inflation falling uh, below three, that is not in our, uh, in our baseline. It is possible um, going forward that you might have a month or, or two where inflation might fall below the uh, 3%. Uh, we will treat it in the same manner that we have treated it when inflation on some months went above 6%. Put simply, we will see through the shock and see whether there are any second round effects that come from uh, that uh, uh, inflation outcome. And if there are second round effects, monetary policy will respond to those uh, second, round, uh, second round effects. The bond purchases, the, as we, we have correctly pointed out, we are doing the bond purchases in order uh, to smooth the functioning of uh, the market. And so if we talk about how effective they uh, had been, we have seen that they have actually uh, been effective because the market continue to function. And let us be clear, we entered the bond purchases program with a clear intention of getting the markets to function in accordance with our mandate. And one of the key functions of the Reserve Bank is to ensure that we have got functioning financial markets. And when we saw a dysfunctional uh, uh, dysfunctionality in the financial market, we embarked on that bond purchase um, a program. And it looks like the markets are now functioning uh, quite well. We stand ready to deploy our tools uh, should we see that there is any dislocation that is taking place uh, within, uh, within the market. So if effectiveness has to be measured in terms of what the intended uh, outcome was, which is getting the markets to function and for pr adequate price discovery to take place, yes, it has been, uh, it has been uh, effective. Uh, Primasha, you asked whether there was any talk of a, uh, a higher um, uh, or a larger uh, policy adjust adjustments to the policy uh, rate. Uh, we deliberate, we get in, and the views that you eventually find, find here, many of us might have gone in, I mean, each MPC member would go into the meeting with their own view. We deliberate, we convince each other, and in the end, you say, I have heard you, and here is my position. And what we have captured here in the statement saying that three members preferred a 50 basis point high, and two preferred a 25 basis point high, a high a cut, 
we decided to go with the 50 basis points cut. Any other questions? Uh, Rashad, is there anything you would like to add on that uh, statistics and data? Okay, any other next questions? Lucanio. Lucanio, your microphone is muted. Okay, you can hear me now, Governor. Good yes. afternoon, Governor. Governor, I also yeah. just wanted to follow up with the question regarding the bond purchases. You, you sort of half answered it a bit. But, but I wanted to check, now you say there's calmness in the market. Is that a, is that, is that a sign that the, the policy has worked or is that a sign that you are still heavily active in the market? So I'm trying to get a sense whether or not you're as active as you were last month, for example. And then secondly, on the issue of two members voted for 25 basis points. And I'm just wondering whether we should read that as an as an indication that the bank is nearing the point where it feels it has done enough now in terms of the stimulation, that that, that is time to slow down its activity. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Thanks, Lucanio. Um, other question? Hi, Claire. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, oh, Claire? Yeah, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes. Yes. Do you have any in principle objection as the NPC to the real policy rate turning negative and remaining so for a long, uh, prolonged period? And also, do you have any in principle objection to the nominal policy rate falling below the 3% lower end of the target range? Thank you, Claire. Um, okay, so um, uh, Fundi, you wanted to add something, or Chris, Chris, you wanted to add something on the previous question on CPI. Chris Lovant, are you there? You must unmute yourself. Okay. Um, okay. Let me take Hillary. Hillary, your electronic hand is up. Unmute yourself, please. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, I've managed to unmute. Um, it's, Governor, nobody actually asked uh, how. What quantity of bonds have you bought in May? You had given us an April and a March figure, but um, if you could provide an update on the May figure, it's almost the the end of May. Um, and may I ask a non-monetary policy question as well, um, uh, directed, I suppose, to the Prudential Authority. What are you seeing um, in the banks in terms of overall applications for assistance, not just under the, not the credit guarantee scheme yet, but the bank's own programs of payment holidays and so on? Um, are they reaching sort of quite concerning levels? And what are you seeing in aggregate from the banks in terms of uh, default levels at this point, uh, two months into the lockdown? Thanks. Uh, Chris Noval, you can unmute your microphone. Researcher, I can. Yeah, I can hear you now. I think I'm on. Okay, I just wanted to say on the um, on the inflation uh, forecast coming below three, um, we don't have that on an annual level. Uh, someone's saying to me, "Stop my video." Okay, we don't have that happening on an annual basis, but we have two quarters this year of uh, headline inflation coming out just below three, two point eight and two point nine percent. So that's quarterly, Q two and Q three, and it's uh, entirely driven by uh, very steep uh, deceleration in petrol prices. Okay, thank you. 
Um, uh, whilst you are at that, Chris, why don't you deal with Claire's question about uh, the repo rate, uh, real repo rate being negative or the nominal rate being below 3%? Um, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the real rate uh, on a um, forward-looking basis is negative. Um, it's moved uh, to about uh, 0 0.6 negative. So that's the real rate level um, uh, four quarters ahead, uh, which is one of the ways in which we think about uh, the transmission um, uh, uh, time duration uh, for monetary policy transmission. So we, we use four quarter ahead as one way of understanding what the real rate level is. Uh, on a contemporaneous basis, it's still uh, uh, positive um, around one. Um, if you look at the real rate level relative to our neutral, uh, it is very strongly negative. So our neutral real rate is about 2.1%. Uh, and if you use a forward-looking real rate, then you get down to a, uh, a very large negative uh, real rate. And that negative real rate uh, stays that way uh, through, uh, through to nearly the end of 2021 uh, in our current forecast. And uh, um, yeah, thanks. Uh Deji Naidu, can you deal with uh, Hillary's question, uh, please? Uh, thank you, Governor. Hillary, we, we don't have precise numbers. Uh, anecdotally, we do have a sense that there have been literally tens of thousands of applications per bank for each of the big banks uh, for what I would call loan restructuring arrangements or payment holidays. Um, we're not tracking this on a daily basis, uh, but we are tracking it fairly regularly. On defaults, it is not yet coming through in the numbers. So we are not yet seeing people miss payments or people stop paying their, their, their installments. Um, end of April, uh, the, the, you know, it was largely a smooth run for the banks. But we are expecting this in the course of the next few months. You know, end of May, I'm sure there'll be a few more uh, missed payments, uh, similar June, July. So we are expecting this in the months ahead. Um, we're comfortable that the banks are well capitalized, have got adequate liquidity, uh, and are well provisioned for an increase in non-performing loans and increase in defaults uh, at this stage. Uh, the regulatory uh, relief measures that we've put in place will support the banks to absorb this uh, while continuing to play their role in extending credit uh, to the economy. On the loan guarantee scheme, we've asked the big six banks so far and about three small banks, um, <laughs> how much would you need? How much do you think you'd need? Uh, and the bulk of the 100 billion uh, that has been pledged in this first phase uh, has been taken up by commitments in that sense uh, from the big six banks and three other smaller banks. Not all of the 100 billion, but actually uh, above 90 billion. Uh, and, and so that's an indication from the banks of what they think they would need. Uh, the actual drawdowns take place weekly. The scheme was only launched on the 12th. So we don't, we have got very, very low drawdowns to date, uh, but we'll monitor this on a regular basis. Uh, the, the, the indications from the banks are that they will need this facility uh, and they think it's quite useful. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Kuben. Uh, Rashad, uh, I don't know if um, your microphone is now working. I hope you'll get it, uh, you'll get it working. Uh, can you the um, a question of um, uh, whether we think that the bank uh, has done enough. Uh, as we say, uh, we think that for where we are, we have provided a lot of support to the economy. But going forward, we will continue to be guided by the data of what we see, uh, the risks attendant to our forecast, both for uh, economic growth and for inflation, and we will respond, uh, respond accordingly. Uh, what is in no doubt 
is that having built buffers uh, over the past while, the Reserve Bank stands ready to deploy its tools in accordance with our mandate to support households and firms. And that is what uh, we have done. And we were able to utilize our buffers across uh, the instruments that, you have, that we have from regulatory to financial policy and to monetary policy uh, itself. So that is what, uh, 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 what we do. The calmness in the financial markets, uh, I'm not sure that I would quite call it calmness, um, but it is a welcome development that we are no longer seeing the volatility that we saw in uh, March and, uh, uh, and April. Um, uh, and we just, for, from where we are standing, uh, are happy that the financial markets continue to, uh, to function. Um, Hilary, you also asked then the question of uh, bond purchases for, for May. Um, we released the results on the seventh day following the end of the previous month. So the figures for May will be released on the 7th of, uh, of June. So that is, where, that is where we are. We do not release uh, any preliminary, preliminary uh, figures. And then there was a question on the chat about the forecast for, uh, for job losses. No, it's true. We do not do a forecast for, uh, for job losses or even for job creation. Uh, what we do know is that job creation come from economic growth. And uh, when you have an economy that is contracting, it goes without saying that there will jobs will be shared. How many jobs? We do not know. But State SA will, as they release the figures at some stage, give us an indication of how many jobs have been lost. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I don't see anything on the chat. Uh, I don't see any electronic hands up. Governor, if I can just come in. Yes. On the bond purchase program, um, and just one thing I wanted to add is that because we are seeking to ensure that markets function, what we pay attention to is whether we see signs of, of stress, and that might not be the case across the yield curve. So it could be that there is a particular bond around which there's a, pro a problem. So these are the things that drive the decisions and the volume of businesses will vary on a day-to-day -day basis, depending on what we're observing in financial markets. Towards the end of April, for example, uh, there was some rebalancing by uh, foreign holders of government bonds because we uh, got removed from the World Government Bond Index. And that had a significant impact on, on the sale of bonds over that period. So depending on what it is that's happening, uh, we might buy more bonds on a particular day or buy fewer bonds on, on a particular day. Thank you. Uh, I see an electronic hand from uh, FIN24. Okay, uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, uh, this is Lamise Umarji from FIN24. I wanted to check if you could weigh in on what the rate cut would mean for consumers. We have economists saying that, you know, we can expect some relief, but at the other side of the spectrum, that could be counteracted by retrenchments, you know, um, during this difficult time. Um, so could the Reserve Bank maybe weigh in on that? Okay, uh, Lindley. Um, thank you, Governor. I, I just wanted to ask a question around your growth forecast. Um, um, we've seen um, some other forecasts suggesting much worse growth figures. Um, could you just um, talk to some of the thinking around um, where you think this, this contraction is going and why? you arguably haven't got a, a higher um, figure for, for the contraction in growth. Thanks. 
Okay, um, Funeko. Hello. Go ahead, Mfuneko. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, uh, Governor, and to the MPC. Uh, for two questions. Uh, the first is, uh, how much of the previous rate cuts um, put back into the economy? Do you have a RAND figure for us, perhaps? And how much do you see this latest cut um, adding to economic activity? And through which particular channels do you see? Do you see that happening? And the second question is, uh, what if any risks do you see of asset price inflation as a result of your open market operations? And perhaps could you also comment on the steepening of the bond curve? Um, it, it, was, that, was that in any way significant in the MPC's considerations, not just for the rate cut, but in, 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 in other ways that it could possibly um, influence market conditions? Thanks. Okay, um, Chris Lovald, uh, growth forecasts and, uh, and then uh, uh, if you could deal with that and uh, DG Chasivana, you must deal with risks so the asset price inflation uh, and uh, Kasim, are you there? I want you to deal with what the rate cut means for uh, consumers yeah. and how much has been put back into the economy as a result of the cut. Shall we I'm start there. with you, um, Professor? Okay, thank you very much. Just, just to follow up on one question, there was a second part to Claire Basica's question about do we see uh, normal, nominal interest rates going to negative? Um, just, just to answer that question, I think that the key, the key thing here is that even countries that have uh, very low uh, interest rates uh, or very low inflation, or in many, many respects, even some deflation, often are, have a slight positive nominal rate. So I think the key issue here is that, you know, the only time you can think about a, a nominal negative uh, uh, interest rate is, you know, when you're really going into the domain of deflation, and that's when you start entering that as, as far as negative real interest rates are concerned, as Chris outlined, depending on whether you're the quarter ahead, or year ahead, we are in negative territory, and that's what we're trying to do at the moment. We are in, in, that, in that space. On the, on the issue of consumption, well, one of the things is that you may have realized that in a lot of the uh, analysis around, uh, around the world, around COVID-19, um, policymakers talk about relief rather than stimulus. And often we think of monetary policy as kind of stimulus uh, in a recession where we want to stimulate aggregate demand. We are acutely aware of the fact that by reducing interest rates uh, in the context of the economic lockdown, you may not see the kind of demand you would under ordinary circumstances see. So what are we doing? Essentially, in an economy like South Africa, you have people who borrow, people have, who borrow at specific interest rates. Uh, these are floating and by reducing the interest rate by 50 basis points now and 100 and 100 previously, what we are doing is we're really contributing to helping consumers uh, who have debt with their cash flow. We don't really make a fundamental difference on the uh, employment side. If someone is unemployed, they're unemployed. The, uh, the whole point about, uh, about um, uh, reducing the interest rate is really helping consumers who, are, who have income or who have debt, uh, and it's kind of uh, making releasing more cash flow uh, for, for, the, for the debt by low interest rate. Thank you very much. Just one point, Governor. Oh, I, I was on mute when you, when you asked me the question the one, uh, uh, around the CPI. The, the one thing just to say is that we, we have a very intense engagement with Statistics Arabica, and like many other statistical agencies, they will have to introduce uh, what, what in statistical terminology is a, a term called imputation rules. Um, as data is missing, they will have to find ways and, uh, and methods of, of, of calculating the data. And I can rest assured, I can give you the, uh, the assurance that Statistics Arabica, at least in the CPI and a few other statistics, are employing 
some of the best methods uh, in imputation to deal with, 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 uh, with data problems. Thank you. Thanks, Rashad. Um, Lovat? Yeah, uh, so on the growth issues, uh, just taking off from where uh, Rashad left off, really, um, you know, I don't think we have a very clear sense of the channels through which the rate cuts and other uh, actions of the bank uh, are going to uh, contribute directly to growth. I, I, the conceptually, I think the idea is much more that uh, it helps households and firms weather uh, the, the lockdown and the uh, negative economic shocks associated with the lockdown. Uh, keep some cash going, uh, hopefully keep people in jobs so that when the recovery comes, uh, they are better prepared to resume economic activity and take advantage of uh, people going out and spending and new orders being placed by firms in parts of the economy or the global economy that start to pick up activity. Obviously, low real rates should um, also send the signal to people that uh, you know, the hurdle rates for investment in the future are lower uh, and that they should be able to, to increase credit uh, to achieve those lower hurdle rates uh, some point after the recovery starts. So the question about the V shape and the W shape matters, um, but we have no control over the way in which those kind of letters uh, roll themselves out. We could just prepare households for the resumption of economic activity uh, by, by, by lowering rates and providing liquidity. On the actual um, growth forecasts, um, look, I mean, the, the forecasts out there are very wide ranging uh, and people have approached uh, those numbers with different kinds of methodologies. Our growth forecasts uh, are based on a supply side view uh, in the near term. So we take a view on the uh, level of sectoral activity by level of lockdown. And then we phase through the lockdown relaxations over on a quarterly basis through time. Uh, and that generates a supply side response, which we build back in. Uh, there's a demand side uh, component to that. Uh, and that's phased in slowly over time as well. Uh, so we have a very big negative shock in Q2, but Q3 and Q4 very quickly turn into positive uh, growth rates on the assumption that um, the lockdown gets phased out uh, over the course of this year. Uh, but these numbers are very uncertain, uh, and they really are very rough estimates. And I, that's true of our numbers as it is true of, of uh, other modelers and forecasters and analysts out there. Thanks. Thank you, Governor. So, Buneko, on your question around the risk of asset price inflation, uh, let me say that one of the reasons why the, the Saab intervened in the government bond market was that we were seeing evidence of stress. So, in some instances, we had too few buyers that, that were there in the market, and these uh, limited buyers where we're setting the price. Uh, and we intervened to ensure that there is proper functioning of the market and that there's sufficient price discovery and that there was an adequate number of, of sellers and buyers in the market. So this is the role that we envisage as, as playing as, as a SOB to ensure that the markets, um, the markets function uh, properly. So in this regard, I would say that the risk of, of asset price inflation through our activities is fairly limited. So we are not creating uh, additional demand and, and our action have not certainly spurred on um, an additional or less supply of, uh, of government bonds in the market. We buy in what, what the market is, is supplying. And as I highlighted earlier, uh, we are driven by signs of stress that we are observing in, in, in the market, uh, and, and we vary our actions according to, uh, to that. Uh, you asked also a question around the steepness of, of the yield curve. So as a Saab, when, when we set out in, in these operations, uh, we're not really worrying about the, the steepness of the yield curve, 
or the the price uh, that 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 is set in the in the market, uh, because that is largely driven by something that's out of our control. So part of the driver of of the steepness of of the yield curve is is also government issuance, um, and and so I think that the the steepness of the yield curve is reflecting a number of factors. It's reflecting the market's assessment around credit risk, and it's also reflecting the, the issuance as well. Thank you, Governor. Uh, thank you, uh, Fundi. Uh, Mfuneko, do you want to come back again? Or is that the previous hand? Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, just. Yes, uh, yes that was the previous end, or yes, I have a question. Discussion or consideration of further rate cuts and how that might impact um, how, how, how the SOB sees the economic situation evolving. Oh, future rate cuts, holds, or hikes, uh, um, if you wait until the next MPC meeting, you will know which way we go. Well, if there aren't any other questions, uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes the business of today. We will see you in July. <laughs>